Welcome back to the Everything Property Podcast. Today's episode marks the start of a sequence of episodes that I can say will hold the most amount of value to anyone looking to purchase a property that we've ever posted. As we're talking through investment strategies, the buy and hold is without a doubt the safest and most popular strategy that a lot of Australians use or look to use. But how do you know how many you need? We're buying a property to retire, right? Or something like that. The strategy is we buy several, we hold for a period of time, then we sell off a few and live off the rent. It sounds a little bit like that one way or another at every barbecue, but how many properties do you actually need to retire? Well, here to help us with this and his property planning software is a guy who knows his way around AI, automated software, property newsletters, waterfront properties, as he just bought his own, and how to buy an investment property or two. Mr. Jordan DeJong, welcome to the Everything Property Podcast. How are you, my friend? Mate, I am so good. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah. It's so good to see your face. <laughs> you can hear you can hear and I'll I'll just um I'll preface this episode at the start to say that just if you want to know in a nutshell what type of bloke he was, he grew up in New South Wales. He now resides in Queensland on the water. And he comes into the studio for those on the YouTube. He's tan. He's got the hair slicked back. He's got the he's got the looks. You can tell. You know he's he's a different he's a different breed. A different breed out there. But mate, look, talk to me first up in terms of your property journey. How does that start? And sort of what does it mean to you as a as a vehicle? Yeah. So my my dad was a real estate agent, and when I was younger, we like used to have all these family dinners with really wealthy people. And as a 14 year old kid, it's the last thing you want to do, right? Is go sit at these dinners. But, um, the best part is I just got education through them. And like a lot of them had businesses and were wealthy some way, but a lot of them parked their money in real estate. And so I learned from a young age, like real estate's good. And then the second thing is on my dad's bookshelf, he had a, a book called uh, Zero to 350 Properties in Three and a Half oh, Years Steve or whatever. Steve McKnight. Nights, yeah, right? Yeah, we've all read that one. So in, in combination with those two things, it was like, well, property's good and I can get 350 of these things. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what, what could go wrong, right? Um, so that was my upbringing. And then I, I suppose moving forward, I studied construction management at, at uni. So I kind of always had that residential building side of thing. Always knew I wanted to get in property, just didn't know how. Yep. Uh, and it wasn't until I actually got married that we, we bought our first house. Um, and it was just a, a house to live in, really. And so, yeah. How, long, how, how old are you when you get married? You, you're pretty young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I that was 24. I just turned 24. Okay. Super young, man. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So it was a property to live in and bought it in 2016. It was like our first property that we got to. Okay. And it's, that was just property to live in. What you can afford? Are you, were you in New South Wales at the time, or was it up in Queensland? No, so I actually, so I was here until I was twenty-one, I think, or twenty-two yep. in Sydney, and then I moved to Melbourne for eight years. Wow, this is the part I haven't told you. Yeah, here and we go. And then, uh, and then, yeah, moved to Gold Coast early last year. Wow. Uh, okay. My wife's family's from Melbourne, so moved down to Melbourne. Why? My family for love, mate. Wow, <laughs> for eight years. Eight years, yeah. Okay, then you got sick of the cold. Yeah, you working down there in construction management. Yeah, so I left my job in Sydney, mm -hmm. and then um, I was doing like data and analytics, yep. like behind the scenes, and started doing like a development role in Melbourne. Hated it. Old company called me up and they're like, "Hey, do you want to work remotely from Melbourne and you can fly to Sydney every now and then and do that?" I was like, "Awesome, what a gig!" Like this wasn't like when working from home was a thing. So, yeah. I just got to work remotely and did that. Was all doing data and analytics. I didn't need to be in front of people or anything else like that. I was just behind the scenes, and yeah, I was still doing that for about three or four years when I first moved to Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's and then why the why the move to Goldie? Well, two things. Yeah. Um, can you say the suburb you bought? Wait, before we get there, can you say the suburb you bought in in Melbourne or not? Uh, yeah. So first property was in Oak Park in Melbourne, which yep. is kind of like in between the CBD and the airport. So kind of mm -hmm. like halfway in between near Essendon, Mooney Ponds for yep. those who are listening. And the move to, to Goldie, uh, two things, COVID lockdowns just killed us. Like it was the most awful thing ever. Like I just couldn't even move five kilometers from the house. It was, it was terrible. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, number two is the cold. Like, I was just, I was just, I'm still defrosting, mate. I was there, <laughs> <laughs> I was there for that long. Yeah, true. Um, and, you know, I could work remotely. So I thought, why not work from wherever we want to work? If mm -hmm. we're going to go to Goldie for a holiday, may as well just go there to live. Okay. And then you moved up. You were saying just, uh, just before at the start, um, when you first landed in the Goldie, what did you do? 
<laughs> uh, so when we first got there, the rental market was really tight. Yep. So we were just like, let's just go stay to the Meriton. Like there's this massive Meriton building on in just past surfers. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's on the beachfront. We are literally, I think there's like 80 floors. I think we we're like floor 46 or something like that. Wow. And we opened up onto the ocean. So like we literally, like our doors, our blinds were just open 24-7. And it was just the ocean just coming in. You could hear it at night. So therapeutic. Oh. You'd, wait, you'd la- like naturally wake up at Stop 4. Stop it, right? You converted me. Oh, no. 4.30 in the morning because the sun would just be glaring in and it'd be super warm and like just want to get out there and go for a surf. It was, it's good, man. Yeah, far out. Okay. And then talk to me. What about prop where? Property goes on the back burner during the move or is there a few more purchases in there or what? Yeah, so we we bought our first one and so I had that like sort of investing background at the start and mm. I kind of knew that I wanted to be in property, but we bought this first one to live in, right? Like it wasn't a, an investment purchase. And then uh, I think it was three years later, I had some time off over Christmas, picked up Steve McKnight's book again and I was like, what haven't I refinanced? What what am I doing like this property? Um, and Melbourne had done all right during that time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, Melbourne had done all right during that time. So I think we refinanced, we pulled out like 150K of equity, which is a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Like I was only 23, 24 or something. No. Yeah. Yeah, I was quite young. Um, extracted that money and mistake number – well, this is probably mistake number two. What was mistake number one? Well, living in Melbourne just the or location Gold- that we purchased. Okay. I wouldn't say that it was a mistake, but yep. we bought it to live in. So the purpose that we bought it for was great. But, yeah. you know, when you think about long-term bigger picture, is it the best investment? Probably not. Okay. But number two, we were literally walking from the house that we lived in to dinner. And on the walk, we saw a house or yeah. a unit that we loved. And we're okay. like, we want to buy this. Yeah. And so mistake number two is buying two properties very close to each other. Now, they are different suburbs. So one of them, first one was in Oak Park. The second one was in Strathmore. Oh, wait. So this is why you're still in Melbourne? Uh, yes. This is okay, why we're sorry. still in Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I this is Goldie. Yeah. No, 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 no. So this is, yeah, this is still early days in Melbourne. So this would have been, I think, 2019. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so literally walked past this house and... I'd been listening to like all the podcasts back then and a lot of a lot of, a lot of the commentators were saying like, you know, don't buy um, units, so just always buy a house and land. If you're buying units, <laughs> buy, um, you know, like Art Deco type type units. <laughs> so you just did the opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, yeah, got to go against the uh, Yeah, yeah. Like, it was like an Art Deco. It was built in the 60s. I was like, yeah, this will be sweet. And like, you know, <laughs> it actually hasn't performed. It hasn't been the best asset, but – it's not terrible. It's not the worst thing that you could buy. It's only in a block of four, which is good. So we still yeah. own a, a good land component underneath it. But um, just the locale, given how Melbourne's performed over the last couple of years, essentially, you know, I'm susceptible to that one mark. I've got two assets in relatively the same area. Mm. And so they both haven't really performed over that time. And so where others, or if I had bought in different locations that had performed, I could have extracted equity, used that to keep going. Mm-hmm. They've kind of just been a little bit stagnant. So, I, you know, I'm I'm stuck in that market with those two assets. Yeah, okay. So that's property number two. Property number three was in 2020. So year after, I was going through the refinance game, read the book, getting into investing, refinanced, and um, this is when I actually started my podcast like, ages ago. Yep. Um, met a few buyers agents who were in Sydney and engaged one of those and just said, hey, we're looking to buy our third purchase. Um, would you be happy to look, f- look for us? And so we ended up buying something in Botany. Um, yeah. which actually done really, really well. Since wow. then. Yeah. Unit? House? Unit, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think it was only, I think it was like 500K or something back then. So yeah, just, interesting. So you're still in Melbourne, you're buying Botany. <laughs> yep. What's next? Yeah, so next is a couple of things, and I think this will resonate with a couple of investors that are kind of at this point in their portfolio, is I was on a, I was on a corporate ladder, had a great job, six figures, really happy, uh, but I went back to Mr. Banker and he said, you can't lend anymore, like you got no more finance. And I go, well, you know, Birchie's got 200 properties. X, Y, and Z's got a massive portfolio. Yeah. It's like, how can I not continue to invest? It's Steve McKnight, you know? Yeah. Um, they've got this massive portfolio. How can I not continue going? I was like, what's this concept of borrowing capacity? Why am I, I limited? Yeah. And so this is when, you know, buttons started to click in, inside the brain and go, well, actually, you know, you are limited to where your income is. And we kind of just sat there. All of our properties that we owned were like two bedrooms. We were never going to live in them forever. You know, we were thinking about having kids and all that sort of stuff. So, mm. like, well, what do we do? Like, what's the, what's the best play here? So, once we were capped out, and most people, this is why I say it's probably going to resonate, because most people, if you can borrow about six times your income, let's say you've got a household income of 200K, 180K, which is the Australian average household income. Yep. Um, 
you can only really borrow about 1.2, 1.3 million. So if you've got three properties at 500K each, that's probably the round, around the same. Or you buy one house, like your dream house or a house you live in yep. at 1.3, 1.4, you're kind of stuck. And so this is where like most people do get stuck because of their income. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it was like, well, there's either two things we can do. We either sell everything and buy a house that we want to live in and re- remain in forever. And mm-hmm. I hate selling property. Yep. Um Main reason is it costs 6% to buy a property. So yep. stamp duty, building pest, conveyancing, everything else like that. And 3% to sell. So agent selling fees, everything else like that. So for me, the transaction costs on property is too high to trade really frequently. Mm. Um, so didn't want to... I mean, s- not even, you're not even taking account like CGT or anything on that. CGT, yeah. buyer's agent's fees, like yeah. there's, there's... Probably 30%, up. but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so didn't want to sell. The only other option was to increase our income. So... Had to start the business. Yeah, okay. And given I was on the corporate ladder for nine or 10 years, I was just like, I was ready. I was really ready to start the business at that point in time. And so, yeah, that was kind of the next step is like, how do we how do we ramp up the income here to then increase investing and keep building out the portfolio? And talk, talk to me about the the game plans is the, the name of the software, but where, so that I can see, sort of see, I can see how you sort of got there, but like, what was the decision and how did you do it was there a final day at work where you quit then you started building did you build it up um while you're at work five to nine nine to five or how did you how did you sort of start it and build it yeah it's it's a really cool story and i think um it's a pathway a lot of people can follow so given kind of where i was at with my career i was doing business analytics like all data science all that sort of stuff behind the scenes and stuck with my portfolio i was doing all these analysis i had like spreadsheets galore like everything spreadsheet was just, king. Yeah, yeah, yeah everything was just everywhere and um i tried to do all this analysis and all this sort of stuff and as i mentioned before was when i started the original podcast and i had met all of these now buyers agents that are in the space that was just starting their businesses right and so when i wanted to leave my corporate career they were kind of all my friends and I just sat them all down and I just said, Hey, look, what's the biggest pain point within your business? Like what are the things that are coming up quite frequently that isn't solved in the industry? And there was a lot of things, but the one big common thing was like providing a really accurate plan based on the client's needs and their goals. And so I kind of said, Oh, well I've built the spreadsheet. Like, do you, can I just sit down with your clients and like help them build out a plan with the spreadsheet that I've built for myself and we'll, like, we'll enter all their data and information. Mm-hmm. And all of them were like, yeah, cool. So I think, like week one, I was working with three different buyers agents, just consulting, building out plans for clients, helping out build systems for their processes and like how to build out their portfolio over the long term. Mm. Uh, and it got to this point where I think I was doing like 60 to 80 hours a week on the phone with clients. Oof. I was working with like six buyers agents. Yep. And because I had the tech background, I was like, this isn't sustainable. Either you've got to hire someone to start doing the plans, but yeah. these guys already run a business. So like, why wouldn't they just hire someone? Mm. Or I can create tech and, and build the software out about it. So I just I just told everyone, give me three months. I'm going to go away. I'm going to go build this thing. Literally built this thing with my hands. Like just every- Yourself? Yeah. D- wow. Coded everything in the back end. Shit. Yeah, man. It's cool. Um, And converted that spreadsheet to an online platform. And that's when we were able to sort of like scale and, and build out the businesses because we could, I could teach the buyer's agents how to use the platform and mm-hmm. then they could go and do it for their own clients. So okay. yeah, that's kind of where the- the progression grew. Perfect. All right. Well, look, the, what we've set up today and how I want to dive into this, knowing sort of how we got there and and um, how you formed and built the platform, which is super impressive. No coding skills? Uh, no, I had tech skills beforehand. Like that's kind of what I was doing on the corporate ladder. But Yeah, but um, you were like data analytics. That's not like co- – that's not coding. Yeah, right? like I was still using Python and, and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so, so you, you were already – Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was kind of diving into it. I had built a few like web apps before in the past as well. Okay, so yeah. there's a little bit of interest and in, um, knowledge there. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, what I wanted to do for today is it, the, the name of the game and the name of the episode is how many properties do you need to retire? Now, for this, I have picked – three different price ranges. One I feel is entry. One I feel is sort of like a staple price point for property investors. And the one is uh, probably for the more wealthy investors with, um, you know, further down the track or with bigger incomes and different means. So the property price points are 350, 500 and 750K each respectively. And what I want to know is us running through this app is how long do they need or how many properties do you need to be able to retire on 150, 150 grand and 350 grand? Now, the reason I've picked both of those, I think 150 is is pretty conservative after tax. 
So a lot of people do 100 grand, but I think with inflation and what it's going to do to that by the time these probably property plans are finished um, and then after tax and all that kind of stuff doesn't equal out to be probably as much as people need. So 150 bigger buffer and then 350 I think is a little bit more comfortable and look, I'd like to keep going, but obviously on the interest of keeping this in, in a condensable uh, episode length, I think if we, we focus at 150 and 350, be a good place to start. So you've sort of went away in the background and and started to plug this stuff in. So can we can we start to sort of run through that? And um, look, for those listening as well at home, uh, this is another episode where you want to as well watch um, watch the YouTube where we've got the screen recording of uh, Geordie's screen. We're going to go through. You can watch it back and you've got to sort of see how this works. Let's sort of like jump into it. Awesome, man. Sounds good. Well, Tell me. I'll give you um, – we'll, we'll give some some background so everyone's got some, some context around yeah. it. So – Household income, both individuals are earning 92 grand a year, which is the average household income. Um, then they've got about 140 grand to start with, which I think is a really good, like it's a strong starting position, but I wanted to really showcase what we could build out within the portfolio. Mm-hmm. So, so wait, run me back through. So gross annual income for one person? One person, but there's two in the household. Okay. So, got- so household income is 140 grand. Uh, 184. Oh, 108. Oh, you've doubled. 90, it. Okay, 92, sorry. two grand each. Yep. And then 140 is what we're starting with in sort of cash savings or liquid okay. savings to use as a deposit to keep going. Okay. Cool. Yep. Got and it. then the other thing that's important as well is we're able to save around uh, five grand a month as well. So some pretty strong savings. We're 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 delaying our gratification here. We're really uh ramping up everything. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> um. Cool. So we'll start off with a 350k scenario and um there's a couple of things that we can have a look at i mean essentially what i've done is um plugged in a number of purchases over six years i think here well we finish in 2031 so you know a little bit of time horizon and what i've done is i've adjusted the 350k price for what the value of that property would be in that year Mm -hmm. based on a five percent growth rate Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. So they might be valued a little bit more depending on how the market performs. So 350 today's rate, meaning by when you buy that last property in 2031, it's now worth 492. 92. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we're Perfect. adjusting for the growth of the properties as well. Which yeah. Is really I'm happy important. with that. Um, a couple of other assumptions I'll run through while we're here. So growth rate at 5%. Now, the Australian average growth rate is about 6.8% mm-hmm. across the country over the last 30 years. So by, I'm, well, I actually use different growth rates for different scenarios, but by using 5% for here, we're being conservative. Mm-hmm. So we should be able to do that. Um, interest rate of six, even though interest rates at the moment probably closer to 6.5%, an average again over time, we want to be at least a little bit higher. Yep. But so we've got a bit of a buffer in there. Exactly. Cool. Um, borrowing capacity at 600%, what this means is most people will borrow about six times their income. Mm-hmm. So um, we're going to have a look at borrowing capacity when we build this out as well, because that's kind of where most most people get capped yep. um, and play around with that. We're going to offset our savings. Um, so if you don't know what offset account is, essentially yeah. it's a, a separate account that's tied to your loan and any funds that are in that co- co- account will reduce your interest payable. So say I had 500K in debt and you had $100,000 in offset, you'd only be paying interest on about 400000 That's how the banks calculate it. Yep. Are we going to refinance on our purchase as well? So we're extracting equity. We've got inflation at 2.5%. So I'll show you you know, with a 150K target where that actually ends up going yep. over the 30 years and then an occupancy rate of 92% as well. So what this means is we're going to allow for four weeks of the year without any rental income, even though it doesn't happen every year. Yeah. You know, every two or three years you might have a tenant move out and look, we've got two or three months worth of buffer just, just yeah, in case. Yeah, maybe there's some renos and stuff in there. Exactly. Okay, cool. I'm happy with those assumptions. Cool. Yep. Um, awesome. So essentially we've got six purchases. We start in this year. And then our last one's in 2031. We're, mm-hmm. We can be pretty uh, proactive. So we've got four purchases in the first four years. So one a year, essentially. Mm-hmm. Probably able to do two in this year if you really wanted to. Um, and then another one in 2029. And the last one in 2031. So the reason we wait for those couple of years is just yeah. because our savings of this individual is really starting to come down. So even okay. for this one in uh, 2027... We actually go into negative a thousand dollars, so we're really cutting it line uh, fine in terms of um, savings that we've got available. Yep, and that's one thing that we need to consider when building out anyone's portfolio is like, do we have, can we can we survive when we do this purchase? Okay, so this is starting as well off one hundred and forty grand. Yeah, and what would happen if, um, say, for a three hundred and fifty grand purchase, people are 
you, you sort of average or what you're going to need to get in the market 350k and you're probably going to need about 50 grand if you're buying it yourself yep. um stamps and all that kind of stuff no ba fee on top of that um if you're just is it possible to do it just off that first 50 60 grand is going to take you longer no no we can we can do that we mm. can add it in but it what will happen is it'll just those f- first four purchases will take you longer to accumulate okay yeah yeah look, can we add it in yeah yeah i want to do it i want to do 350k someone that's starting at 350k buying those value assets that's that's a that's your entry fee i've said it um, on the podcast and um, similarly before when we get too low past that so if we get the 100,000 and 200,000 property prices there's a lot of risk there with those markets so i feel, feel like 350 is your your barrier is your your entry level property price around that it might be 320 might be 370 but anyone that's getting into the the property game and buying at that rate they're just saving up enough to make that first purchase so let's do it, George, if we can, like 60K, for example, saved in the bank because that's what everyone, people that are just starting in property, I feel like that's sort of what they're moving up towards. They're trying to get to that 50, 60K saved in the bank and then they can um, sort of go off that. Keep going from there. Yeah, yeah 100%. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I, I suppose all it's really going to do is what we need to wait for is the values of the first couple of properties that we accumulate to continue to grow. Mm-hmm. Then we can extract that equity and uh, leverage that to continue going. So Perfect. lower deposit to start. Um, as I mentioned before, like you might be able to do two in, in the start if you had a bigger savings deposit. Mm-hmm. But now we're just going to do one. Yep. And we're going to wait a couple of years. So if we do one this year, Another one in two years, and then we can be pretty aggressive because we've allowed the first two properties to grow. To grow, yeah. perfect. And the reason is is that you need to wait the the two years is because you'll both you'll save a little bit, but then you'll also refinance the equity out of that first property. So the reason is uh, you wait two years is because you've bought in with ten percent um, deposit. You need to wait to build equity and for that LVR to be about eighty percent. Uh, that LVR to be below eighty percent, and then you can bring it back up to. Are you assuming bringing it back up to eighty percent LVR? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So savings-wise now, we've got some ups and downs, but we're, we're comfortable to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, and still same six acquisitions. It's just going to take another year. So okay. it's that goes to show, right? Like you don't have to have a massive deposit to get started. If you've got 50, 60 grand, you can still do it. It's just going to take you a year longer if you're going to wait. Okay. And you're telling me that, that to get to that first 150 goal, I'm only going to need six properties. Yes. Wow. Correct. Um. Yeah, inflation adjusted as well. But it's going to take a little bit of a time to get there. That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. Got- I mean, if you're starting at, you're starting at the, the basics and that, that price point is what it is. We're good to go. Mm. So um, total portfolio value after we've finished the acquisitions in 2034 is around $3.7 million. Wow. Uh, and we've got debt because we've been refinancing the whole way of around $3 million. But still means we've got about 750K worth of equity. So not Shit. a bad yeah. it's like ending position in terms of that acquisition window. And we're actually like nearly able to fully pay off our debt over the 30 years as well. Um, and if we have a look at our passive income target, so we've got a target of 150 grand. Yep. And if we inflation adjust that over 30 years, we actually end up at about 314 grand. Needing, that's how much you need? That's how much you need. Okay. So, Jesus. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so we can see here, and this is like really important for those who are, get, are getting into investing. So the first couple of years, are pretty, we're okay. We're kind of neutral in the portfolio. Just for everyone's reference, I used a 5.5% rental yield for the lower values at the 350K because typically yep. they have a higher higher yep. rental yield. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but then as we continue to recycle debt, pull out equity, increase our loans, which are higher, we're using that 6% interest rate. In 2034, once we do that final acquisition, we're actually paying 44 grand outgoing to the portfolio. Mm-hmm. So it's quite a heavy outgoing. Yep. But really, this is a breakup of we've got 180K worth of rental income. We've got mortgage repayments of around 175 yep. and running costs of around 50 as well. Okay. And that's using all the conservative numbers with, you know, four weeks of the year, no rental income, all that sort of stuff. Okay, cool. So not too bad. Your rent's almost covering, but then it's the main, um, maintenance and repairs. Running costs, property management. strata, yeah, okay. council, all that sort yep. of stuff. Okay, fair, fair. Um, so that's at the – so say if we're starting at 2024, at 2034, after 10 years – that is when you're going to have the most liability in terms of out of your pocket, which when you think about it, if you're starting this in your 20s or your 30s, you're probably on good bread by the, in another 10 years, right? Your income's probably jumped up that that amount to cover it. Yeah, if not more. Okay. 
Um, and if you're on a good good wicket, you could potentially use um, negative gearing as part of that. And mm-hmm. also, hopefully, we do go into a lower interest rate environment, you know, back what we were seeing a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, the cool thing is, from there, we really start to use that offsetting effect and um, lay out our – or get our repayments down. So, by 2039, we're actually positive around three grand. 15 years in. 15 years in. Okay. We're positive. The portfolio is paying for itself and putting some money in our, in our back pocket. Mm-hmm. That's, no. This is at a 6% interest rate, right? Correct, yeah. Are we able to, and I hate to kill you with it, but can we tweak this to see what happens in a 4% yep. interest rate environment? Definitely. We can do that? Yep. Because So let's just say peak of your debt is after 10 years and 15 years was when it starts to get in the green. Now, if you change that now, and it's not likely that we're going to have a 6% interest rate, I'm hoping for the next 15 years, but let's just, uh, if you can... Yeah, so we've got um we've actually got a default chart which is plus two percent interest rates or yep. or minus two percent interest rates. So this will take us down to four. But essentially, if we go back down to a four percent interest rate environment, mm-hmm. we are positive from day one. We're a positive a thousand dollars. Wow. In twenty thirty four, were we? Yep. Yeah, we're After actually 10 years? yeah we're actually positive thirteen grand. Okay, so that's what I want to. That's the um that's the. That's the point I, I suppose I want to highlight for people that are listening to this because people worry a lot about interest rates, but the way you've got to sort of look at them is that they're going to come and going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. So it's not going to be one flat rate at 6%, 2% or even 4%, but that's good to know because 4% is, uh, I think, a very reasonable target for planning and mapping. And if you're saying that you're almost positive from the get-go, not a bad little, uh, not a bad little portfolio. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, this is right. Like, if you remember three, four years ago, almost yeah. there's a lot of properties you could get that were positively geared. Mm. You know, if your interest rates at four and you're getting a five and a half percent rental yield, like it was quite normal to have a neutral cash flow property. But today, it's a lot harder. Yeah, I saw people. I saw someone post up this week about coming off a two percent interest rate. <sighs> yeah, it's cheap. Yeah, it's so cheap. yeah, yeah, yeah. So God, God forbid, if this was down to a two percent uh, interest rate, what would what would happen? Oh, yeah, you okay. Know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Exactly. Well, if we go up 2%, as well, it yeah. goes to 75 grand or 100 grand at the worst case scenario. Yeah, wow. So, you know, it can go either way. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we stuck to our 150K mm-hmm. at a uh, 2% interest rate, so down to 4%, mm-hmm. we actually hit our passive income goal of 150K by 2047. Okay. That's not inflation adjusted. So that's when we, we get there. It's yep. going to take a little while to so get there. So 2047, we started in 2024, so 23 years. 23 years. Okay. Yep. yep. Portfolio is paying for itself. And then um, inflation adjusted, if we go 2047, really our target should be about 260 grand. So okay. So accounting for the value of currency coming down. Mm-hmm. So we don't hit our target by then, like our inflation adjusted target. Yep. But we, so, so that two six that you just said, just so people know, that's the hundred and fifty, but adjusted for inflation in that year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yep. So the costs of goods and services increasing year after year. Yep. Um, and we don't hit the three hundred k range, but we get pretty close by uh, twenty fifty four, mm-hmm. uh, where we've essentially got four hundred k worth of rental income coming through. Wow. Still have a bit of mortgage repayments, but we're nearly debt free. And running costs of around ninety grand, so generating around three hundred grand from the portfolio. Jesus. Okay. Cool. What What would happen if um What would happen if you sold a property? So, can we put that into this? If we sold a property sooner, uh, oh, it's got to play out. <laughs> All right. So if I we, knew you'd ask that yeah, question. in case you just want to sell a property quicker, buy out, um pay back a bit of your debt sooner, which is what a lot of people do. You know, maybe you buy six, you hold them for 10 or 15 years, you sell two, pay off the other four, and then go from there. How does that sort of, yeah, how so does that the, change everything? So the interesting thing about the the sell strategy, I mean, we've only factored in a 5% growth rate, so it's not like it's growing exponentially. So you probably would have a little bit more that you could pull out from equity or mm. sell off with profit and pay off. But yep. the good thing about selling is you, you increase that, 
time of when you're starting to get passive income. So by 2040 now, you're generating around 50 grand a year, which wow. means you've paid off a fair bit of debt. Mm-hmm. The bad thing about selling is you actually lose the rental income of the two or three properties that you sell, right? Yeah. So your final position over the 30 years is actually a lot lower than what you would be if you could just hold on to those properties. Okay. So um, we end up with about 233 grand, but you know we're debt free from a very earlier earlier position. Mm-hmm. We're positive much earlier. And we're probably feeling a little bit more comfortable with some cash in the bank as well. Okay, so it's not going to be, there's no right answer here. It's just depending on everyone's sort of risk profile and how they want to set up. If they have, um, I'm just trying to think this through. If you're starting earlier, you're probably likely to be able to hold for longer. So if you're starting sort of early 20s, mid 20s, 30s, maybe able to hold for longer. However, if you're starting, you know, mid 30s, back in 30s, if you're starting that and you're only having those 20 years of compound, maybe you want to think to sell something. I'm just thinking it through. It's obviously not financial advice, but my understanding would be you'd almost think about selling something earlier to get that positive cash flow started sooner, do you think? 100%. And yeah. it comes down to like the strategy that you implement. So um, for, for this one and another one, I won't mention it, um, mm. the sell strategy isn't like that beneficial, but... For one of the plans in particular, like you almost have to sell to build up that passive income stream. Okay, so cool. it'd be cool to take you through it. Nice. All right, what's next? Awesome. Well, we can jump to the – well, I'll just mention on, on the back of the end with, with the borrowing capacity that we do have with this household income, even if it's growing at like uh, inflation as well, so your um, wage increase is in, in, in increasing at the same rate as inflation, um, we do get capped at the second last or, or final purchase as well. So um, – we we'll probably can do four acquisitions really easy, major four banks, super simple. Yep. Then we might have to move to a second or third tier lender yep. to try and, try and get that fifth lending. And then for the last one, we're probably going to have to use different type of entity structure or something else. Okay. It's going to yep. be a little bit harder to get into that final purchase. Interesting. All right. Too easy. Cool. Well, we can move to the 500K yep. purchase so, now. Sorry, go back to – if you can go back to 350, we'll do a summary. Yep. So – 350, a bit of a summary is that, oh, here you go. Okay, you're starting in 2024. We're making, okay, so look, I'm buying my first property in 2020. At, at this strategy, where I, where, at what year have I reached that mark adjusting for inflation? How many properties do I have? Seven properties. Seven properties? Yep, and you reach it in 2047. 2047, starting in 2024, 23 years. Yep. Okay. Perfect. And how much income? Um, sorry, let's run through the years that I'm buying a property. 24, I'm waiting two years, I'm going 26, I'm waiting two years, I'm going 28. Then after I've got a few under my belt, I can go 29, wait two years, 31, 32, and then 34. Okay, perfect. And the purchase prices, the first one's going to be 350 grand. Uh, adjusted for inflation after two years, the second one's 368, and then it sort of builds up year by year. Um, at a 5% growth rate. What we will do, I think, George, is we'll package this up as well. We'll put something maybe together um, online if you're, if you're interested in to seeing and, and running through this and, and looking through the notes, we'll put out a, a PDF. Um, so, yeah, we can send that through to the people after the episode, but perfect. And talk to us about the income position. Yep. So from an income side, um, we'll go to the 4% interest rate because I know that's where you want to be at. Yep. But essentially, we're neutral all the way through. Yep. Um, portfolio is paying for itself. We end up hitting that 150K income by 2047. And then uh, we end up getting to about 300K over the 30 years. 300K, that's with seven properties with no debt? No debt. How does P&I and I in interest only work into this model? We just assume for interest only. So okay. for my personal strategy is I refinance every three or four years, yep. um, go back to a five-year interest only period, yep. and I use the offset account to reduce my interest payable. Okay. So, but So at the end of that, then you have, you at the end of the 27 years, you st- still then have the entire principal, right? Got the entire principal, but yep. like we've got in, um, in 2047... We've got uh, a total savings of around 1.8 million mm-hmm. and a total debt of 3 million. So you could essentially just take all that 1.8 in offset and pay off half the debt if you wanted to. Okay. It does the same thing. Yeah. And then move to a PI loan. Or you could do, as you said before, like sell one or two of the properties, yeah. and pay off the debt. Completely. So, but tell me if, if you're just breaking this down, if you get to, you, you're getting to year 27, seven properties, the debt's not paid down. You do have the passive income. Um, What's the exit strategy though? 
because you're going to get to a retirement age where then you can't refinance. Correct. So we need to then sell? Um, not necessarily sell. I mean, you could sell, but yep. I would just look at it depending on how much a debt I could eliminate. So mm-hmm. if I had 1.8 in savings, I could elim- eliminate half of the debt or if not more. Plus potential super coming into play and eliminating the debt from that way. Okay. Or exactly as you said, sell one or two of the assets, eliminate the debt completely, and then yep. you roll into retirement. Okay. Perfect. All right, let's um let's jump into five hundred thousand. Let's do it. Did you want to use the same um fifty K deposit for this one as well? Um let's go a little bit higher. Let's go like uh what have you got for the model assumption? Uh, I, it kind of uses all the same. So I think we had six sixty k before. What do you reckon? I reckon we can use a hundred. Yeah, yeah, we'll do a hundred for this one. Okay, we're set up. We should be good to go. So, um, yeah, so this will push out the purchases a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. But essentially, um, so let's let's set it up. So the next stage, next purchase price is five hundred thousand. Little more, more seasoned investors or someone that has a little bit more money, and for this assumption, we're going to say that you're starting your property investing journey with a uh, hundred hundred grand in savings this time. Yep. All right, Ryan Stewart, George, what's awesome. the thoughts? So year one, after doing our first purchase, uh, our purchasing costs are going to be around eighty grand, and that leaves us with about thirty five grand worth of savings. So we're comfortable from a savings position, yep. which is good. Um, and then essentially we're doing. Hang on, go, go back. Eighty grand purchase. Purchase cost thirty five grand savings. Yeah, so we started with a hundred. Yeah, plus we got savings in that year though. Oh, okay. So we've saved we saved thirty five grand in that year. Okay. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. Um. Yes. We at the end of the year we end up at around forty grand. Mm -hmm. Um. Essentially, what we're doing with this is four acquisitions. Um. Until twenty thirty. Now we may have to push these out depending on how big the deposit is. If we're starting with a hundred, we will. But if we can get away with it, we mm-hmm. can essentially do four acquisitions over six years, essentially. That's it. That's it. Wow. And is that getting to 150? Uh, no. It's getting close. Yeah. But this is kind of like when we hit our borrowing capacity limit. Yeah. And then we can build out and sell more if we want to as well. Okay. So, um, it, infl- like inflation adjusted with our passive income. Again, we're kind of neutral from the start. And we'll have a look what it looks like at the 4% as well. Mm-hmm. But worst case, interestingly enough, we get to negative 43, which is kind of similar to what we were seeing beforehand. Mm-hmm. And then uh, over the 30 years, we're now getting to about 230K worth of passive income. Wow. So rental income of 307, no debt. So we're debt free on this. The portfolio pays for itself. Mm-hmm. And then we've got running costs of around 75 So that's P&I then? Um, interest only. So yeah. the using the offset to pay off the debt if you want to. Okay. Yeah. Um, we can factor in P&I if you want to. Yeah, well, I mean, the uh, we can. I just want to know when we get to that end stage, when we're finished, the what are the exit strategy options? So it's like, is if this uh, buy and sell down, or how can people conclude and finish up this portfolio? Right. Yeah. So in twenty fifty, the overall exit strategy is we'd have a market value of around eight and a half mil. Yep. We'd have a total debt of two point one. Wow. Or two point two, but we'd also have um, total savings of two point two. So this is us, instead of paying principal and mm-hmm. forcing it into that loan, meaning we can't get access to it, putting it into that offset account and not touching it, just leaving it, letting it accumulate and build up over time. Mm-hmm. So exit strategy, ideally, would be to just take that savings and clear out the debt completely. Okay. So you'd be te- debt-free, essentially. Mm-hmm. Portfolio pay for itself. Um, but we can do a scenario where we do buy one or two more and then pay off the debt as well. Yeah, if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. If it's if it's not a if it's not a ball break to put in, we can do it. Nah, it's all good. Um, so if we do another one in twenty thirty two, we'll go five hundred k. Get the future value. It's about seven hundred and just shy of eight hundred k. We're using a five percent rental yield for this one. So now we are above our borrowing capacity. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've borrowed more than where we were. Yep. But um, if we look at I don't know. What's the goal? 15 years, 20 years? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in 20 years, so 2044, we look at doing a sell. We're going to sell the first two assets that we purchased. Yep. They'll be worth around 1.5 in that period. And we sell the first two because they've, they're the ones we've left for the longest amount of time to bake and, and grow. Yep. Capital wise. Yep. Yep. And they'll be generating around, um, $1,000 a week at that point in time as well. Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, that's another two grand a week that you're potentially missing out on, which is a bit rough. But um, the good thing about doing this is we essentially go from, uh, we immediately have a big jump in our passive income. Mm. So we go from 22 grand to about a hundred grand in 2045. After 20 years. After 20 years. Yep. And then over 30 years, we get to uh, about 250K worth of passive income. Jesus. So if you can hold on to the properties and keep paying down the debt with offset, then you can end up in a better passive income position. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, if you want to get there earlier, selling off the properties and eliminating some of the debts, but the way to go. Okay. But just as long as people know that by selling them off, you're in the long run, in the you're doing it for cash flow quicker, but not as much in the long run. Yeah. So you're not going to have more cash flow heading later into retirement, which mm-hmm. a lot of people like. They want to enjoy it while they're earlier, right? They'd, mm. they'd rather enjoy it while they're 50 or 60, rather than get to 80 and now all of a sudden they've got like 400K of passive income but mm. can't get off the chair. So yeah, okay. you really got to find that line. Um, but you do get more capital growth if you hold on to them as well. So just like you got to get to that point where you're like, okay, we're, we're well off. We, 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 we can survive. We're going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, let's sell and do the exit strategy. Yeah, okay. Um, on the 4% interest rate, where we were before, we hit our passive income goal um, of 150K by 2047. Wow. And then, um, yeah, we still get to the same position because we're debt-free on yeah. the portfolio by 2054. Perfect. Happy days. Yeah. Um, so, less purchases. We can either do four at 500K. Yeah, and keep them. And keep them. Or do six. Slowly pay down the debt. Or do six and then when sell When you say two. slowly pay down the debt, you're just doing interest only repayments and then you're save are you what are you calculating that you're saving and putting in the offset? Yeah. So we're doing um the five grand a month that we said that we're gonna save. Okay. And out of that we're taking out um holiday spends yep. and car spends. Okay. Depends on the client, but essentially it would be like five grand a year of holidays. Yeah. And maybe thirty or forty grand worth of car spends every five years. Okay. So we're taking that out of savings as well. Okay. Interesting. Plus you've got the passive income, whether it's positive or negative coming in and out of that savings pool as well. Okay. Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, cool. Do you want to jump into the 700K scenario? 750K. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Are we starting with a, a larger deposit? Yeah. I think if you're starting at 750 grand uh, and that's what you're buying in it, you're, you've got at least um, you're at least 150. 150. Is that, is that all right? I like it. Well, that'll work. That'll work. We'll see. All right. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So... Let's let's frame this one up. Uh, Seven hundred and fifty grand purchase price. Now, this is obviously um, if someone's building a portfolio, starting and, and buying at this rate, they have a substantially higher income than the people that we've looked at previously that are buying at three hundred and fifty grand, and they probably need to buy less of these properties. But they also come into this with more money to start off with. Can't be getting into seven hundred and fifty grand with yeah with not a lot of money. So you got to make sure you have the savings there. For this example, I am uh, I've put on there 150 grand, which is roughly 20 percent. So you wouldn't use all that up first; you'd use your 10 percent cost, and then you'd have a little bit left over. Yeah, not too uncommon, I don't think. No, I think it's good. Um, that gets us a, a purchasing cost of around 160 grand, which is a 20 percent deposit mm-hmm. plus stamp duty, building, pest conveyancing, all that yep. sort of stuff. So we're good. We're good because we're saving a little bit in that year as well. So a little bit of a different scenario now. Instead of buying four in four years or one every two years, um, we've got a bit of a gap. So our first purchase in, is in 2024 at 750, and then we don't buy again until 2028. And the value of those properties, and I'm factoring a 7% growth rate now, is just under a million dollars. And what this goes to show is like the earlier you can get into these assets, the more of that growth is going to be in your portfolio rather than growth that you have to pay for later on. Mm-hmm. So if you can get into these things earlier, then by all means do so. And is that because you, the reason you've done it four years later, so first property purchased in 2024, the reason you've done it four years later is because you've just done the accumulated, uh, the average savings rate and, yeah. that, and that's when you'll have that's end when the we've growth got rate. Enough. Okay. Yeah. But let's say if you've got like a big bonus or you come across money in your business, you'd be able to put in another purchase in there before four years. Yeah. So okay. if we did um, 2026, so two years from where we are now, mm-hmm. it's closer to 860 grand. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're essentially going to be like negative 130 grand. Like we won't have enough to pull that out to continue going. Wow. So um, you'd either need like a big in- increase in savings or um, yeah, big bonus, as you said. Okay. Cool. Um, 
And then we're doing a, a third purchase in 2032. So it's always, it's all kind of like the same time horizon. So we're looking at like a 10 year buying window here for yeah. all of the scenarios. Um, and the final purchase at a 7% growth rate at 750 is just under 1.3 million. Okay. Um, rental yields are all at around sort of four and a half percent. Typically they are low when you get to that high, higher price point anyway. Yep. Um, and the interesting about this scenario is it's the only one that I would definitely want to do a sell scenario for. Yep. Because you don't have, you've got a really good strong growth component, which means you can use that those funds if you need to, but you don't have a lot of that strong high income coming through. You know, mm. with the 350 Ks, we're using a five and a half percent rental yield, so it's a good starting point, and they increase year on year. Mm. But if we're starting at four and a half percent, and the growth it continues to grow, and the rent's not increasing at the same rate, mm. we're not going to get to that certain point, right? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So. From a cash flow position, again, we're going to be negative on that first 10 years. We're now negative around 70 grand, which is a lot worse than where we were with a 500K and a yep. 350K. Yep. So you're right. This is for the high income earners who can afford the um, higher repayments. We go neutral by uh, 2041. So essentially 16, 17 years from where we are now, we mm-hmm. go neutral in the portfolio. And then we have a nice little journey upwards in 2051. And then what I did in 2051 was essentially sell off the first asset that we purchased. I cleared out the debt of what we had on the, the portfolio. And then I bought a $2.5 million high income type asset, mm-hmm. um, which was a commercial asset at a 7% yep. yield. And what that did is essentially ramp up our rental income to around 490 grand. Uh, sorry, 390 grand. Wow. And our running cost is still around 65. So we've got a net passive income of around 320 grand. Wow. Okay. Definitely over, and that's adjusted for inflation. That's yeah, okay. That's higher than the adjusted for inflation figure. Exactly. So that's when we do cross that line of 150k. Okay. Jesus. Perfect. And I would say like that's probably how most people would build out their portfolio is yep. just get into like the best possible asset that you can right now. Continue to accumulate assets and get into the best possible assets that you can at any point. Okay. And then once you get to that point where you're comfortable with your equity base and your asset base. You do clear out some of the debt, or if you don't have to, maybe at a lease stock loan or something like that, uh-huh. move into commercial, which is the high income side, and let that take over your passive income stream. Like it's a lot easier to get a, a net passive income on commercial at 7% uh-huh. than to try and build out 150K, 300K income producing residential portfolio. Uh-huh. In the property summary, though, you had another property in there in 2051. That was the commercial, the last okay, commercial the purchase commercial. that we did, okay. yeah. So um, we bought one in 2024, 2028, and 2032. Yep. Sold this one that we purchased in 2024 and then purchased this last one in 2051. Wow. Okay. Two and a half mil at a 7% net yield. So you've only got three properties in your property portfolio and your income was what? 300 and... Um, yeah, 320 grand. Shit. And really a lot of that's driven from the commercial, right? So... Prior to the commercial, we're at only about 130, yep. 160 grand. And then with the commercial, that's where we really ramp it up because it's debt free. Yeah. We're okay, using the equity off purchase number one that we'd accumulated and buying that commercial cash. Fair enough. What are some of, so that's probably, that's probably it in terms of the three different um, buying points. What are some of the what are some of the main sort of uh, mistakes that you see people make in these in mapping out where they want to go and um, you know passive income and properties need and stuff like that? Are you seen anything sort of common with a lot of people you're talking to in this space? Yeah, a lot of people change their mind, and that's okay. Like people need to change their mind, but they don't take sort of things into consideration. Like you know, I'd speak to a lot of younger investors who might not have a partner at the moment, and five years go down the track, they get a partner, they get Mm. married, they start to have kids and they go, actually, we need to buy the dream home. And so they do what we did with, like we maxed out on our personal portfolio. They don't factor in the dream home and then they're kind of stuck. Like, well, do we increase our income or do we sell some of the portfolio to be able to do that? Mm. Um, That's probably the biggest common one that I factor in. Um, The other one is just not factoring in some of those worst case scenarios that we had before. So if we look at some plans, that we created like three or four years ago, some of them were using the 4% interest rate and accumulating and buying properties going, oh, the interest rate's going to be 1.8% forever. We're going to be millionaires. <laughs> and then they get to an environment that we're at now at 6.5%. Yeah, okay. And they're actually in a really like bad negative position on their on their portfolio. It's costing them quite a bit. So I would say like planning for sort of worst case scenario is something that not a lot of people do mm. and go, okay, well, worst case scenario, if interest rates do go to 6 or 7%, are we still going to be comfortable? Are we going to be able to hold on to this portfolio? Yep. 
we're not going to have to do a fire sale because we're out of pocket so much. Because as I said before, that's the biggest wealth killer is, is trans- transacting on property. Okay. What do you, when do you think or how do you how do you structure in that that PPR purchase right? If you can't get to the end the end goal, have the passive income, and not have or you can, but obviously people don't like doing it, and not have the big PPR or the the wherever to reside. So like, how do you guys factor in have factor in the the PPR and that purchase because it's it's obviously a, a debt that's not returning income, right? Yeah, it's a tough one. I think rent vesting has become a much more um, recognized strategy these days just yep. because of the the, well, the 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 highness of the interest rates at the moment, but also that strategy of like, well, where does this fit into the portfolio? Yeah. Um, the good news with that scenario that I was talking to you about before is like if you've got a young investor who's hungry and keen, generally they've got a, an income that they're using to invest with. And then when they do partner, their partner's also got an income and then they've increased their borrowing capacity and they do have a little bit in the tank to potentially get into it. But it's really about just like sitting down together as a couple and going, well, what do we actually want out of our portfolio? Like, mm. do we want to, like we've traveled heaps in our, like in our journey, Sydney, Melbourne, Queensland. So, yeah. you know, if you're a rent vester, you can kind of live wherever you want to live. You can move around, you can do what you want to do. Or once you have kids, you might want them to be in a particular school for six years. So it might make sense to be in that family home and be close to family and everything else like that. And once you've defined what you actually want, then you can factor in which way that you want to go. Yeah, okay. Is it how hard would it be to factor in a purchase of a property uh, in one of these plans that's a PPR? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's use the middle one. The 500K? 500K? Yeah, okay. yeah, yep. And do we want to buy it like halfway through the journey or? Okay, so uh, oh, look, there's a million and one scenarios. <laughs> I know our majority of our audience is uh, 25 to 35 years old. Okay. Um, so we'll go like. Uh, so let's say they're starting at 25 and they want to buy it at 35 uh, or, or 30. 32. 32. Yeah. I like it. Seven years. Seven years. Start at 25. Seven yeah. years. Buying at 32. What? what let's, uh, let's factor let's it in and see how it go. sort of... So the main thing to consider with that type of scenario, if we look at seven years, which is, uh, what are we, 24, so essentially 2031. Yep. We're kind of capped. We, we've bought those four or five properties by then mm-hmm. and we're capped out. So we need to make that decision of do we increase our income do we sell one of the assets? What do we do? Or we future plan and go, actually, we want to buy the, the principal place of residence then. Let's not buy the fourth or the fifth asset mm-hmm. until we do that. But let's just say hypothetically we're able to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, business. Uh, one of someone started a business in the relationship. Maybe it's two people. Someone started a business or they've increased their salary significantly and they can afford to buy it. Let's just say that. Yep. You're going to ask me for purchase price? Yeah, what are you thinking? Are they are they buying in New South Wales or are they buying in the Goldie? <laughs> it's up to you, mate. Are I they mean, buying a, a two million dollar yeah. waterfront? Or are they buying a two million dollar <laughs> box? Okay, look, let's be seven years time too. Yeah, well, we can do it in like a growth value for future purchases. So, like, put it in today's dollars. What do you think? Oh, in today's dollars? Yeah. All right. Let's say uh, two mil. Oh wow. Okay. Wait, what are you thinking? We're going heavy. Okay. No, no, no. Shit. Like, I want to see. Like, it's going to be good. So, two mil yeah. in 2031 yeah. at a 6% growth rate will be three mil. Okay. Essentially increased by a million bucks. Um, 0% rental yield, obviously. It's a principal place of residence, and we're <laughs> yep. using a, a 20% deposit. Yep. Borrowing is good. We're able to do so. But now what we're going to see is a big purple line populate on our passive income chart. Yep. And uh, essentially, we go from a negative position of 40 grand on the portfolio. Yeah to uh, negative uh, 235 on the portfolio. Okay. So the mortgage repayments at 6%, it's going to be about 140 grand a year. Plus, you've got the running costs around 45 grand on that as well, which is quite high to be honest. But um, I guess that kind of just shows you in perspective, like even with the portfolio long-term bigger picture, we never really get across that line. But if you're buying something around $2 million, you're probably going to have much higher incomes than we factored in here anyway. Okay. So it's it appears to me by then um, that might not then be the solution because it's going to be a lot of um, that's going to be a lot of money up front out of your pocket ongoing costs mortgages servicing what's the what's the absolute peak of that debt in twenty thirty four so ten years after purchase yeah so we're at a negative position of around three hundred k three hundred k and the year out total pocket. debt level thirty four was about seven mil worth of debt okay. Let's tweak it up a bit. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go opposite, and I'm gonna say 
Um, so that's all, that. That obviously, if you can service that, that's it. That that's your strategy. But I'm going to say most people won't be able to. So let's just say. Um, well, I'll, like what we're doing with the portfolio, yeah. and this is kind of where we're at right now, right? Mm-hmm. Like we bought the three investments to start. Yep. And then we moved to the dream home. Like that, well, that was what we wanted. We Waterfront, yeah. yeah. We wanted to walk on the beach, boat out the back, fish out the back. Like that's that's our lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> um, you got the boat? No, not yet. We got have to get the car. Not yet. I had to get the car first. What was the car? Tesla. Oh, <laughs> what model? Uh, model Y. My man. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, family car. I had to. Um, what we're actually planning to do with the portfolio, because yep. two of them are in Melbourne, we're going to wait till Melbourne returns back to the normal. Yep. Take advantage of that market cycle. Might ha- might be five years, 10 years, doesn't matter. But whenever yep. it happens, we're going to do that. We're then going to take the equity from those assets and reinvest it into a very high income type asset. Commercial. So it might be like a commercial property, exactly. And we're going to aim for something like a net yield of at least 6.5%. Mm. And so by doing that, we've got the really strong growth property in our principal place of residence, which is yep. growing capital gains tax-free. And then we've got the really high income asset with the commercial of a high net income. And together, they kind of offset each other because we've got the high income that's coming in and mm-hmm. we've got the growth factored in this way. Okay. And then we're not dealing with the three or four other tenants in the other properties that are doing my head in all the time as well. So yep. you're really like niching down into the two assets that you really want. And look, there might be future purchases from there moving forward. This is just kind of our strategy now. Yep. Um, and you just got two really great assets. Yeah, okay. So it's not even a number ego thing, right? It's just like a being able to cover the debt using one onto the other. Let's just say, um, hypothetically speaking, 500 grand scenario again. If year 10, I sold out everything. I sold up. I wanted to buy, let's see how much money I had. I wanted to buy the PPR and or commercial property, then a PPR. What sort of position would I be in? Because I feel like people start at 25 or they start in their 20s and then by their early 30s, there's, um, you know, partners knocking on the door, wanting kids, wanting to settle down, want to find that little nest and all that kind of stuff. So where where would we be, for example, if we sold everything and we were at year 10? Sorry that I'm stitching you up with all this on the fly. But, Dude, I know, love it. It's my, this is, it's just, this is this my is jam. jam, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, essentially the profit from the entire portfolio, so after we've paid out our debt, um, pay the capital gains tax, pay the agent selling fees, everything else like that. We get a nice injection of around 350K, which if you accumulate that with some savings that we've done over the time period, like 10 years is not a lot, a lot of time and it's only at a 6% growth rate, so it could be better. Mm. Um, we've got the 500K and guess what? The 500K actually gets you the $2 million property as a deposit, yeah. but the value has gone to 3 million. So we're probably going to have to keep it at two. Yeah. Um, but in, in terms of like where that brings the portfolio now is, um, in terms of a negative position, we're at negative 190. So it's still 144 grand worth of mortgage repayments. That's because I bought the three mil PPR, right? PPR, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. We could bring it down to two, but. Yeah, it could bring it down to two, but I mean, it's all, this stuff is never going to be totally accurate unless we're doing it for someone's, uh, particular circumstances where we're merely just speculating here and testing out a little a couple of little um yeah a couple of little circumstances all right are you able to add in that instead of uh with those properties that we sell down we then buy like you're doing one commercial asset with a seven percent yield with as much as we can get for 500 grand you said we had yep okay so if that's a Use a thirty percent deposit. Yeah, oh, I mean, let's go a one point seven million dollar commercial property. Be a bit, bit cheeky, a bit more savings in there. Let's do it. Seven percent net yield. Yep. Um, uses a bit of a higher interest rate as well, seven and a half percent for commercial. Um, if we did that, yep. Essentially, we would be positive twenty four grand the year we that we bought that. Wow. And then we've got a really smooth journey. Is that after I'm paying back the mortgage on my PPR? Oh, no. This is instead of the PPR. Okay. Yeah. Did you want to include the PPR, include the PPR as PPR. well? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. We're going to do two. Yeah. On the fly, man. It's, you know you're good when you can uh, just take all these questions. I prepared a brief for, for Jordy. We did that, and now I'm just throwing absolutely anything out the bloke. So, <laughs> on the fly. Man, this is this is what we do day in, but these day out. Yeah, these are a couple of... Couple, uh, couple of assumptions so let's see it so um 
investment portfolio would still be positive at 24. But mm-hmm. when we factor in the PPOR, we're only negative 62 now, which isn't terrible, right? Like, yep. like overall, everything. Portfolio 62K, is it's 30 grand. It's 31K each between you and your partner. If you're on high income jobs, Okay. Plus, you've got your dream, like your dream, you house, your dream house, and you've got a high income asset. Okay. The cool thing is, is once we fully offset all our debt, we're actually positive um, hundred grand by twenty forty five. So, dream house plus good income, mm-hmm. and then we actually get to two hundred and sixty six worth of passive income over the thirty years. So, house is paid off, debt free, and uh, we've got two hundred and sixty six grand worth of income coming through. Not a bad scenario. And how many properties? Just two. That's all it needs to be. That's all it needs to be. It's yes. as simple as it can be. Yeah. But you do need to build the portfolio from the start. I think that's really important. Like if you're just starting at 350K and like you're hearing these big numbers of two or three million, mm. don't get disheartened. Like I started there too. Like you you, you need to build the portfolio to continue going. Mm. Then you maneuver and build your strategy around how things change. Yeah, that first purchase is without a doubt the absolute hardest, putting that first deposit together and then you leverage into an asset and you've got equity and all that kind of stuff. Jordy, look, I appreciate you coming on. I've got two last questions for you. Um, I think I've racked your brain enough and put you through all different situations. But what's the what's the golden golden nugget? Something something of um, important value or something that you can give to the the audience to to um, think about or use for the next situation or p- property transaction? Do you have anything you can share with me? Yeah. So uh, most people talk about this like light bulb moment with property, yeah. but I've had two. So the first one was in like understanding property investing. But the second one is just understanding the relationship of debt and inflation. And if you're listening to this, I'm guessing you know what inflation is because we've talked about it a few times. Hopefully. But, um, but also it's been talked about a lot in the economy lately. So the same way that, you know, the basket of goods and services, let's say it cost you a hundred grand last year, this year it's going to cost you 105 grand, which means if you're earning a hundred grand a year, it's actually going to cost, it's, it's going to take you longer than a year to save or accumulate those funds to buy the same basket of goods. Mm-hmm. Same thing happens to our debt, right? So if we've got $100,000 worth of debt and we're only earning $100,000 this year, well, it's going to take us a full year to pay off that debt. But as our wage increases over time with inflation, say, basket of good now costs us one hundred and five, our income goes to one hundred and five. what's going to happen is it's going to take less of our time to pay off that 100K of debt. Because 100K of debt doesn't increase, it mm. inflates away. So if you're earning 105 over the year, it might take you 11 months to pay off the debt. But if you blow that out and compound it out, your wage over 20 years might get to 200K. So what took you a full year to pay off beforehand now only takes you half a year to pay off. So I really used to be uncomfortable with debt and how it worked. I'd see a big number, like $2 million worth of debt. I'd be like, that's a lot. Am I ever going to pay that off? But with inflation over time, it brings the value of the currency down. Our incomes increase and we can pay that debt off much quicker. Perfect. Great little summary, great little analogy. And last but not least, uh, Geordie, please tell me what is a quote you live your life by? Yeah. So a dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. And a plan backed by consistent action becomes reality. There it is. Heard it here first. All right, Jordy. Jordan DeJong from Game Plans. I appreciate you coming on the Everything Property Podcast, mate. Thanks for coming on. Mate, thanks for having me. Hey, guys. Before we wrap up, I wanted to share something special with you I've been working on with Jordy. Jordy and I are collaborating to give three audience members a property portfolio planning session. Now, whoever comes first will come into our Sydney studio and record a live property portfolio portfolio mapping session that will be broadcasted to our entire podcasting audience whilst the other two winners will do the planning session online from the comfort of their own home. Now, I've made this as easy as possible to enter. All you need to do is follow Everything Property and follow Jordi DeJong on Instagram. Now, if you don't know how to spell that, head over to Everything Property Instagram. We've tagged him in all the posts. And the second thing you need to do is head to the link in our Instagram bio, fill out the, the Google form. It's literally like your name and your email address. It tells us just who you are and that's it. We'll draw this live on Facebook and Instagram two weeks after the episode goes live through a random ballot online system. So if planning out your property portfolio is something you want to do to get crystal clear on your goals, what you need to acquire to get that passive income and how long you need to spend, I strongly suggest this is something you enter. It's completely free, all costs covered by us. Best of luck.